Kieran Mosky. Um, and she is a child neurologist who specializes in sleep medicine. Um, she's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and director of the Neurology Sleep Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, her clinical and research work is focused on pediatric central nervous system hypersomnia disorders. So I think we're going to uh, have a very enlightening uh, address. So welcome, Dr. Mosky. Thank you all. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with all of you today, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good discussion at the Q&A session. So I'll be talking today about narcolepsy in children and adolescents, um, and we will be coming to uh, sort of very specific um, parts that were not hopefully repeated in other um, presentations, but we'll be talking about the diagnostic delays that occur in pediatric narcolepsy. We'll be talking about comorbidities that are very common in this population. Um, I'll go over some of the recent recommendations from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the European Medical Association in terms of treatments for pediatric narcolepsy. And then I think it's really important to talk about transitions to adult care, um, as this is a really <laughs> important issue uh, in our field. Um, these are my disclosures. And um, just to talk about that, really, I think it's been highlighted a few times in, the, in this presentation that these conditions, narcolepsy and uh, a related condition, idiopathic hypersomnia, typically start before age 18 years of age. And in some situations, people are even arguing uh, that these are oftentimes uh, really should be considered pediatric or adolescent diseases. Um, narcolepsy type 1, about 14, it's a, the prevalence is about 14 out of 100,000, and that makes it a rare disease, of course. Um, but 66% of patients report that their symptoms actually began before age 18 years of age. Um, it might have been delayed, which we'll talk to in terms of the diagnosis. The peak onset is typically between 10 and 15 years of age. The prevalence of narcolepsy type 2 really is lesser known, probably because of diagnostic uncertainty issues. But from recent billing data, it does seem like this is the rising diagnosis between narcolepsy type 2 and 1. Type 2 is vastly outpacing new diagnoses. Um, in that population, about 34 to 50 percent of patients report that their symptoms began before age 18 years of age, and the onset is typically in adolescents in this group. Um, now, Dr. Thorpe had talked to you about diagnostic delays and this issue of a decoupling between when the symptoms actually begin and when the symptoms are actually diagnosed as narcolepsy, and that's what the gray and the dark um, black lines that you're seeing there represent. We had done a follow-up survey with a consortium of uh, narcolepsy patient advocacy groups, including Narcolepsy Network, um, basically looking at, is this still a problem? And this was a survey that was sent out to about 1,400 patients. And surprisingly, it really still is a problem. So in this survey, um, almost a third of patients were saying that it took 10 years or longer for them to achieve a diagnosis of narcolepsy from when the symptoms started. And um, of those patients who had diagnostic delays, pediatric onset, meaning that the diagnosis, uh, the symptoms began before age 18 years, um, doubled the rate of having a delayed diagnosis. Um, the lack of having cataplexy also doubled the rate of a missed or delayed diagnosis, and that's obviously because it's probably the most recognizable symptom of narcolepsy. So to address these diagnostic delays, um, we developed and validated this survey called the Pediatric Hypersomnolence Screening Tool. And we did this in a way that was actually very similar to the panel um, that you just had up here. We had focus groups with patients, their um, teachers, and their uh, parents. And we're really focused on what were early symptoms that they wished were recognized at an early point. And there was a really rich discussion as we just had here. Um, we took that and then we whittled it down to a smaller number of questions and then validated it across three different sites, Geisinger Medical Center, Boston Children's Hospital, and the King's Daughter Medical Center. Um, and we had about 100 patients with either narcolepsy uh, or idiopathic hypersomnia, 100 patients with other sleep disorder, and 100 control patients. 
And you can see some of the questions that we found and in, are included in this survey are things that actually have come up here. So sleepiness, um, obviously being having difficulty with sleepiness, uh, cataplexy, the REM-related phenomenon of vivid dreams, and fatigue, feeling really tired all the time. These were sort of some of the domains and questions that we had. But I think specific to kids, I think, some of the more um, important things we got from that focus group was how to ask the questions appropriately. And it was really remarkable how much sleepiness was not really appreciated both by the patient or even the adults in their lives, but it was really noted by the peers. Like if, the, if the friends or something noticed that they were falling asleep, that was the first time they really recognized they had a problem because it was not just in class or something boring, it was something that they wanted to do. Um, and then we validated it against um, uh, objective tests, um, such as the MSLT and other validated instruments, and found that it was uh, a very good uh, screening survey. So now we're trying to promote this use in healthcare practitioner offices, as well as schools, um, so to make sure that when sleepy people come up, that they can be appropriately screened for. The validation of this um, suggested that if someone took the survey and met a cutoff score of 24 or greater. Um, the sensitivity, meaning are we capturing all the patients, was 81%, and the specificity, are we ruling out false positives, was 81%, which is pretty good in terms of diagnostic tests. Um, just to say that most of those questions I showed you were really narcolepsy-based, we have a subscale for idiopathic hypersomnia that has pretty good sensitivity of 89%. So, Moving on to pediatric narcolepsy comorbidities, um, this is something that I feel like is not really well talked about, and so I hope to sort of go through these closely. Obesity is something that is a very common issue in pediatric narcolepsy, and I think Dr. Mignot um, talked about this early, that oftentimes it presents at the early onset of symptoms. About 25 to 60 percent of patients are reported to have obesity as a comorbidity in this population, and oftentimes it's very difficult to get rid of that weight. Um, in specific, we don't know the mechanisms as to why people develop obesity in this population. It might be that they have more sedentary lifestyles, but people have looked at, you know, do they burn calories as much as uh, other people who don't have narcolepsy, and it seems like there's mixed results there. Importantly, there's no endocrinopathy, such as you might have heard of leptin, ghrelin, sort of that balance your eating and your uh, desire for food seems to be normal in this population. There's no associated other um, hypothalamic areas that seem to be injured. So we really don't know what causes this obesity. And it's actually interesting, the one um, uh, informative study I saw is an old study that looked at just eating behaviors, and they found that people with narcolepsy had uh, less um, satiety responses, meaning that if they were given salty, sweet foods, they had a tendency to overeat them more so than people without narcolepsy. So it might be that the feelings of sleepiness or the lack of recognitions of, of cues make people um, crave foods <laughs> more, and that's how the weight accumulates. Precocious puberty is a big problem as well. So this is development of sexual characteristics early before age 10 years. And this was noted in a number of um, studies um, and the range of precocious puberty will vary depending on site, but it ranges from 16 to 42% of the population. And this is of course really important because if you go through precocious puberty too early before your bone plates fuse, you can actually have a stunting of growth. So there's a real opportunity to help uh, patients realize their actual growth potential if we can address precocious puberty in a timely fashion. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, so this is something that's been brought up in other uh, uh, talks here. 25% of patients can have this. And this might be related to the obesity issue that I had just mentioned, a risk factor for development of obstructive sleep apnea, but um, certainly something that requires some screening for if people are feeling sleepy or their medications are no longer working for them and they're choking or having apneic episodes or snoring at night, important to keep looking for something else. Um, periodic limb movements, this constant twitching, and I'll add restless leg movements, can happen in nearly a third of patients. 
Um, and then uh, hypertension, which I think is a topic that will be discussed tomorrow. So about 40% of patients who've been studied with narcolepsy, even before they start medications, have high blood pressure. And when the um, medications are added, that number goes up to 60% have hypertension in some studies. So I think that's an important you know, number to keep in mind because we know hypertension is something that is associated with long-term cardiovascular mor morbidity, and especially in a pediatric population, you don't want them to start that risk factor too early in life. Um, other studies have looked at associations of increased GI symptoms, constipation, dysmotility, um, things that cause uh, GI discomfort, such as irritable bowel. Uh, other things are headaches, including migraine headaches, and uh, other endocrinopathies, such as thyroid disease. So there's a long list of other medical conditions that certainly um, need to be on patients with narcolepsy's re radar to, for screening. In terms of some of the behavioral and psychiatric comorbidities, attention deficit disorder um, is uh, present in about a third of patients, and this is adults and children. And interestingly, this was work from uh, Dr. Lessandro in France, where uh, they had looked at the population uh, of people who were treated for sleepiness and went to look if they still had ADHD, because a common question is, is it just the sleepiness and ADHD is a secondary manifestation? And what they found was that even among people who have treated daytime sleepiness or reporting good control of their sleepiness, the ADHD scores were still high. So there might be some executive functioning problems in a, in a cohort of patients. Um, you heard about the brain fog and other sort of issues brought up in the patient panel. Um, at least in the literature, it sounds like IQ is pretty normal or even higher in narcolepsy patients when it's actually looked at. But patients have oftentimes problems with attention or focus or working memory, and that might contribute to those feelings of brain fog. Um, other mood disorders, even including obsessive compulsive tendencies, depression, and anxiety, um, are present in about 25%, and I've seen even up to 33% of patients. And that can be really um, something that you need to very closely monitor when you're taking your medications. As you heard, many of those medications can exacerbate those conditions. And a more recent attention has been focused on psychosis or schizophrenia associated with narcolepsy, um, with reporting up to 10%, which I find personally a little high and might be related to the cohorts they were looking at. But um, still, I, you know, we do see kids who have psychosis associated with narcolepsy, and it can be very difficult to manage. Now, some of those patients who've been studied have been found to have antibodies um, that are, are associated with um, what we call autoimmune encephalitis, um, and that can be treated maybe a different way, but most of the patients in these studies don't have those antibodies. So we really don't know if there's something intrinsic about narcolepsy that might inherently produce this type of um, comorbidity. In terms of how to manage these comorbidities as, as parents or patients yourselves, um, it's important to obviously have these things on your radar and bring them up to your physician for discussion. But um, things like precocious puberty, these are, might not fall into the typical workflow of, of your sleep physician or your pulmonologist or neurologist who's um, taking care of you. So it is important to make sure that you as a parent are sort of aware and checking for any concerns or early development with your pediatrician. Um, growth, uh, asking for the growth curves and making sure that blood pressure is checked at every visit is really important. And this used to be like a given, but now with telehealth, <laughs> you know, it might be that you could go several visits without ever having your blood pressure or weight or, or height checked to know if you're on the right curve. So if that's where your care is being given or the care delivery, you do have to make sure that someone's monitoring these, these uh, features. Um, and then in terms of uh, what you can do if you have ADHD concerns, I don't know where, where you are, but for us, there's long wait times for neuropsychological testing. It's not always feasible, but there are plenty of freely available screening tools on, on, uh, that are available through the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics, such as the Vanderbilt forms or Connor forms, that can be used to assess for symptoms of attention deficit disorder. 
And this is particularly important in the pediatric population because it goes into their education plan. So we offer additional resources, for instance, if um, we're concerned there's ADHD. Um, and then it, obviously screening for depression and anxiety. I think you know there's a long wait list probably everywhere for psychiatric or psychological resources. Um, but again, there are freely available screening tools that your physicians can be using to make sure that things are noted in appropriate time and services can be directed. Um, not every, I mean, it's actually a very rare group that has a multidisciplinary clinics where all of this is like available at a single visit, I would say. I only know of a couple. Um, but um, most providers that I know have sort of networks, maybe informal or <laughs> formal, where they are working with a psychiatrist that they've educated on narcolepsy or a, a, an endocrinologist or so on. So these are the people that you want to make sure that you see so you're not, you know, re-going <laughs> re through everything every time and people have an understanding of the conditions and can work with your provider with medication changes. Um, and then, of course, just bringing up, you know, concerns about uh, comorbidities as you're trying to pick an appropriate medication. So, for instance, if you have a condition of attention deficit disorder and narcolepsy, a medication like a traditional stimulant might actually be beneficial because we know that it's useful for both symptoms of sleepiness as well as attention deficit disorder. However, if you have a, a comorbidity of anxiety with narcolepsy, stimulants can really make that worse. So, you know, these are thoughtful things to discuss when you're picking a treatment regimen. Okay, um, in terms of clinical practice, um, so <laughs> unfortunately in pediatrics, there's a real lack of, of data to inform treatment decisions. And so we are often using medications that have been approved for adults um, and then using them on our own in pediatrics for best care. So the recent development has been in 2020, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the European Medical Association were trying to put some data behind decision making. And this is not a new thing, but they really have been uh, focused on the data in order to make the decision making. And so both groups got together independently to come up with recommendations. And they did it a little differently. Um, so although they're using essentially the same data that's available in the literature, there were more stringent um, rules that were used for the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And I just mentioned that because some commonly used medications such as Prozac or fluoxetine or uh, venlafaxine, which you might be on for your narcolepsy or cataplexy control, are actually not in the, in the American Academy list of medications to use. And that's because there's actually very little data um, showing a benefit in, in a controlled way. And so you have to take these recommendations with a grain of salt. Um, but just to go through them, they do end up with slightly different recommendations. So in modafinil, for instance, you heard Dr. Mignot talk about that earlier as a medication that primarily works through the dopamine system. Um, both groups reviewed the data for this for pediatrics, and guess what? It was a study of 10 kids. <laughs> so when I talk about you know data, it's, uh, it's actually unbelievable how little we're actually working with here. But in that study, there was an improvement of daytime sleepiness of about six points and fairly minimal um, side effects in that population, even though it's not approved for kids under 17 years of age because of concerns of psychosis and uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, a very rare uh, skin disorder. But in, in a cohort of, of this group and a larger cohort that was looked at retrospectively, they didn't have those problems. So the groups felt like there was enough there to make a recommendation for use of modafinil, but you know, noted that the con it's a conditional recommendation because there's not a lot of evidence for it. Um, sodium oxabate was the other medication that received a four recommendation for use for children with narcolepsy. Um, in the European guidelines, they said that it was a strong recommendation for cataplexy control as well as daytime sleepiness and maybe a weaker recommendation for daytime sleepiness, sleep paralysis, and hypnagogic hallucinations. 
um, the American Academy said that it was just a, you know, a conditional recommendation because the study, and although it's the first randomized controlled study that was done in the pediatric narcolepsy population, it was a withdrawal study, which means that they um, gave drug and then withdrew it and saw how the effect on cataplexy was in that situation. And the task force members felt it was difficult to assess that compared to other uh, randomized controlled studies. Um, in terms of other treatments, uh, amphetamine uh, is, and, and methylphenidate, these are traditional stimulants that are commonly used. These are FDA-approved medications for the treatment of daytime sleepiness with pediatric narcolepsy. But guess what? There's actually very little data <laughs> to support the FDA recommendations. Um, the European guidelines said that there was enough there. We felt like there was insufficient data to even really use a, uh, make a recommendation. Um, but these are very commonly used medications in any case. Antidepressants, as I said, there was really no data for use of cataplexy control. Um, Pitolisant, um, there was some early evidence of support for use in the European guidelines. The American Academy guidelines couldn't issue a recommendation on that given minimal data. Um, and same thing with Sorian Vital, very little data. So in the end, um, in pediatric narcolepsy, we have two drugs that are FDA approved for the treatment of uh, pediatric narcolepsy. Again, that's uh, stimulants and sodium oxabate. And then in terms of clinical practice guidelines, there were only two recommendations, midafinil and uh, uh, um, sodium oxabate, um, which received recommendations for use in the, uh, in the American guidelines and a broader number in the European guidelines. Um, oops, sorry, I think I'm slowing down here. Okay, so, but in any case, the European guidelines, I thought, did something very helpful. They had an expert consensus where they tried to pull some of the data together to give practical recommendations for treating providers. And um, this is a busy slide, but the idea was that if you presented with just daytime sleepiness as your chief complaint, that you, know, you could use some of these wake-promoting medications such as stimulants or uh, uh, modafinil or armodafinil for treatment. If you presented with daytime sleepiness and cataplexy, the goal would be monotherapy, meaning a single drug that could affect multiple symptoms. So there, something like an oxabate and pitolisant would be considered. And if you presented with daytime sleepiness, cataplexy, and disrupted nighttime sleep as your main concerns, um, only oxabate really has been studied that affects all of those symptoms. And so this kind of decision tree, I think, is in an ideal world <laughs> how, how people would try to practice to minimize risks and um, uh, maximize benefit. But unfortunately, as you, as you probably know, uh, insurance ends up ruling the day here. And oftentimes, at least in my state in Massachusetts, we have to do step therapy, meaning you have to try two stimulants and fail them before you're allowed to go on to the next one. And that decision tree is even stricter in pediatrics. Um, additional considerations, and I'm just bringing up Oxibate here um, because it's, it is FDA approved for children on how to actually use this in the pediatric population. We do a lot of preparation before um, they start Oxibate because it is something that requires a normal duration of sleep. You don't want circadian issues or insufficient sleep um, of that population to have exposure to Oxibate because frankly it won't work and they'll have more side effects. So we do a good amount of preparation of regularizing their sleep timings, weekends to weekdays. Um, as you know, you have to take the second dose two and a half to four hours later. We, we noticed a tendency for kids to basically pick up their phone during that time and what would have been just a few minutes break in between uh, doses now becomes a 30 to 60 minute window of tick tocking and <laughs> all this stuff and so you know it's things that we really try to minimize by keeping them ha or their phone out of the room altogether. Um, avoiding heavy meals, um, basically making sure that if they're driving that there's a six hour window from the time of the second dose to the time they're behind the wheel because they could be impaired. And this is where things like school policies where high schools sometimes start as early at 7 or 7.30 in the morning 
really impact our decision making with oxabate. Um, and then, of course, counseling on alcohol, marijuana use, things that can affect um, the safety aspects of using oxabate is really important. And as you get to college, there's more preparation um, that needs to be done. So here we're looking for um, if they need priority registration before um, uh, choosing their classes so they can get it based off their nap schedules or if they have a lockbox and there's a lot of preparation we need to do for where their dorm is um, if they were on oxabate if in case of a fire alarm or something like that are they on the first floor next to an RA someone who could actually assist them out Behavior management, I think, is going to be covered a lot tomorrow. You have a whole session on this, but very briefly, um, scheduled naps, which has been brought up before in the prior session, really important. Um, having a place for them to sleep during the day that's quiet and safe is, is part of good planning. We go over sleep preparation, as I mentioned before. Um, I think it's really important that kids are encouraged to maintain activity and I say that because oftentimes when we're negotiating 504 plans or accommodations plans with the with the schools the first thing they want to drop is the gym class and that's actually like a very helpful thing for people to have to maintain alertness um, and so on and so these are I hope I'm on the right slide oh sorry here um, so these are important things to start thinking about so the ability to have advocacy as part of the agenda uh, for your your patient is really important because they're oftentimes the ones who know what they need and have to be able to negotiate it with their teachers so extra time for projects um, test taking you, they might need um, stop the clock breaks and we've gone through some of the college uh, needs so just in the last few minutes, I just want to briefly talk about transitions to adult care. And this is really becoming a hot issue because most of the times narcolepsy is diagnosed in adolescence. And it is a very cold day <laughs> when you're turned away from your pediatric provider and have to find adult care. So just very quickly, why is this even important? Well, if you don't have um, good you know, care and you don't know who to contact for urgent issues, those are situations where we're finding people coming to the ER having hospitalizations. If you can't make a follow-up appointment on your own, then there's a delay in care. There could be a lost prior authorization need and you find yourself without medications and so on. And then we do know that younger people are, are making more risky decisions let's say, and so we do need to make sure that they receive the appropriate anticipatory guidance. Um, in a 2016 study where basically they did a survey of, of parents who have kids with special needs, they looked at how well these transitions were actually occurring, and 86% said poorly. So how do you actually achieve this? Um, there is a roadmap. Um, so ages six, 12 to 16 years of age, it's encouraged that the kids themselves spend more time with their provider without a, a parent or guardian with them. Now, I am the mother of a 13-year-old, and I know I can just see the eye rolls right now. Um, so this doesn't always happen smoothly. You know, if you ask how things are going, fine is the typical answer, and then you get an angry call from the parent later. So I would say here it's important to prepare for the visit. So have a list of questions you go over with your child before the visit or email the provider beforehand so that they, there can be sort of a natural uh, flow to that conversation. Um, and they need to start knowing how to contact their physicians in case there is a, an emergency situation. They should understand how to reorder their medications if needed. Um, and they need to know how to, um, uh, the, uh, some basics about their insurance as well. And then from 16 to 18 years of age, they really need to start preparing for that once they're 18, they're responsible for their medical information. We can't actually talk to uh, mom and dad anymore. And so that is uh, you know, something that they need to start developing their own portal account, for instance, and uh, be prepared for that. They need to know their insurance policies if they're going to not be able to see a pediatric provider anymore and start looking for people who are within their network that also have recommendations um, from the current provider and if they have comorbidities, who those are going to be managed by.
Um, once they're 18, um, that's, you know, for some clinics, a cutoff. In our clinic, it's up to 26 years of age. But this can be where, again, um, the parents are locked out of the medical record. They can't call. We can't talk to them. It's, it can be very uh, difficult. And then once you transfer, decide to transfer, um, I'll just leave with this thought that it is really important to set up, I think, at least a half hour to an hour visit with the pediatric provider to get a summary of all of what has happened over the last you know, five to 10 years so that when you transition to an adult provider, all of it is in a, in a what we call a warm handoff. Um, so what medications have been tried, why they were stopped, the dates that they were stopped and used, all of that's really important. All right, so in conclusion, diagnostic delays are improving, but still, still very much a problem. Um, and hopefully, instruments like the pediatric hypersomulant survey, and I know there's another one recently been developed, um, can be helpful. We have very few medications available that are approved for pediatric narcolepsy, and more clinical trials are needed. Um, you cannot manage narcolepsy in the pediatric population without behavioral supports and recognition of these comorbidities, and really adult transition planning has to start early. So with that, I'll, I'll have a few minutes for questions, and then I think we go to the panel, and I can answer more. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, so for me, I am a person with narcolepsy, and some of my earliest childhood memories were the hallucinations and the nightmares and not understanding the difference between dreams and realities and you know those memories still last not knowing if they were a part of my childhood or not so can you kind of go over a little bit how those symptoms kind of differ in adults and children and content wise yeah that's really an interesting question um no one's really done a great study on that but i can tell you clinically um typically what the hallucinations in the pediatric world tend to be scary so seeing a threatening image in the room, um, seeing a figure in the room, a shadowy figure or something like that. Um, the younger children have more simplistic imagery, so usually an animal. <laughs> I, I thought I saw a cat in my room or a dog in my room. Sometimes I hear about like thought bubbles, like almost like in a cartoon. <laughs> so it's like within their realm of what they see in everyday life, they're basically reimagining. But yeah, it, it, there's no real, um, study to say what differentiates it in adults to, to pediatrics. And then the words they use are different. So like sleep paralysis, oftentimes kids will say like an elephant was sitting on me or someone was pushing me down, things like that. But, but they're experiencing about the same things. Thank you. I'll go to that side of the room. So speaking about the transition to adult care, uh, we have a 20-year-old son who's off in college so we've sort of in that transition mode of he comes back and still meets with his sleep doctor. Um, and temporarily we've put in touch or we put in place like a HIPAA authorization so we can, yeah. so as he moves towards adulthood and assuming say he doesn't return home, as a parent, if, if he wanted us to continue to be involved, would a HIPAA authorization be enough for us to be able to communicate with his physician or yeah. As they get older, do we need to take additional steps? So there's usually something separate, a medical authorization form that's needed, and um, that might be clinic to clinic specific, but for most, that is what you use, and it basically is where the patient is saying, I authorize these people to have you know conversations with these people, and it's a very specific thing. We keep it in the chart. That's amazing when, you know, when someone calls, and that's not an uncommon request at all. You know, for medications or other things, college students are really busy. Um, Oxibate needs to be delivered, you know, to the parent's house. All of this stuff. So, by no means um, does anyone expect, you know, someone moving off to college to be to, to suddenly do all of this stuff. And so, I think there's just formal processes in clinics to make sure that's clear. Um, I just had a question about with medications. Um, I have a severely impacted teenager um, who we are very fortunate that um, we have a very good sleep specialist and with um, 
a combination of medications is, is doing quite well. Um, and she took responsibility for coordinating her meds from the time she was 15. Um, as a parent, it was a real gut punch looking at her sitting with a, a bed tray in front of her and just filled with bottles, um, doing her, her med, you know, and mixing up her Zywave and keeping track of all of yeah. that. But I mean, I'm very proud that she does it, and I'm very, very happy that she has the result that she has. But I have to say, it terrifies me. What are we doing to her body? We don't have a choice. Um, and even if we did have a choice, we would still make this choice because she's functioning. Um, you saying that there's really only two meds that are really approved for this population, and so, yeah. <laughs> um, I was doing it anonymously, and she revealed herself. <laughs> uh, um, so you don't really have a choice. You do what you need to do. Do we know if there are long-term effects, anything we can do to minimize those effects, anything to look out for, um, you know, livers, kidneys, eyes, hearts, um, we do know that there's you know, comorbidities, and so the first med she was given for cataplexy sent restless leg off the chart, and she appeared to be having seizures every three minutes around the clock. So I know that you don't really know, and everybody's different, but if you can just kind of give us like... Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, and we don't have formal longitudinal data tracking this. Um, there are some... Uh, uh, disease registries that are now looking to do this, um, so you can look out for those. But we do have clinical experience, and so at this point I would say we're not seeing signals of something really harmful happening to kids who've been treated for long periods of time on any of the drugs you just mentioned. Um, stimulants is the one thing that, you know, we have the longest experience in, so there, I can say, when we're looking at our own data, because I tend to transfer my patients to a neighboring hospitals where I can follow what's happening, um, hypertension is the thing that I see as the biggest issue and early cardiovascular issues related to that. So that's sort of my thing that I've been worrying about and trying to keep controlled. Um, but we're not seeing things like increased addiction. We're not seeing things like increased psychi psychiatric issues that were newly you know, present after use of something for a long period of time. Because you said cardiovascular, and I've, I've been seeing a lot of, co I don't know if it's comorbidity or just coexist, I don't know, um, with POTS. Yeah, well, um, is POTS, that what you're referring to, or is that different from the cardiovascular uh, it's, you're it's talking this, about? You're right. It's a, it's similar. So POTS is a uh, condition, uh, positional orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is more a uh, autonomic dysfunction, and there basically um, with position changes, there's an exaggerated tachycardic response, and people can oftentimes feel fatigued and deconditioned with that. That's different than the cardiovascular. So when I'm talking about cardiovascular comorbidities, I'm talking about heart attacks, congestive heart failure, um, you know, strokes, complications of having unchecked high blood pressure. So I think that's where, you know, we're trying to maintain um, a reasonable balance between wakefulness <laughs> and monitoring for some of these safety things. You don't have anything else, right, Mom? <laughs> okay. So um, I was talking to someone who apparently was diagnosed back in the 60s, and she was telling me some stuff about service animals um, that not only then um, can they like detect when, say, with cataplexy, when it's going to happen, but kind of like help make sure that when it happens that it's kind of person is safe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I sat, I was at the beginning of your thing, I had to go get giant supplies, which, um, so I wound up missing most of it. Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Does yeah, of course. Um, so I, I have had a few patients who've had service dogs in particular, um, and they find it very helpful um, for cataplexy, so if they fall or near fall, the, the dog has been trained to nudge them. So there are specific things these animals have been trained to do. Um, falling asleep in public situations, the dogs will nudge them awake if they're on the train or, or you know, in a potentially dangerous situation. And then I think the other thing is just um, the routine needs <laughs> that dogs have helps keep people in 
a, a normal routine. So they have to get out and walk two to three times per day. And that is actually a good thing in terms of management of daytime sleepiness and making sure they're not sleeping too long in the afternoons or whatnot. So um, just the, the care you know, aspect. And then in, and an emotional support animal. You know, Anxiety and stress are a big part of this. I think animals can be very helpful in that domain too. <laughs> yes. Um, my main concern is that uh, my daughter was diagnosed at like 10. So at this point, as a teenager, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, the anxiety, the stress levels, um, I know that a lot of stuff is related to age, age appropriate behaviors. But my concern is how do we know that the medications are helping, hindering? Are studies being done on the children at this age where we can actually see, you know, certain types of behaviors, you know, certain types of things that they're doing to manage stress? Some, I know that um, some, you know, the fidget things, she twirls her hair. You know, it's been an issue. I don't know if other children do this. I don't really hear much about it. I just feel like there's not enough for the children, the adolescents, enough studies on them. Yeah, you're right, because anyone under 18 years of age is considered pediatric and excluded from a lot of these studies. But what I can say is, um, at least in like the oxabate, sodium oxabate study, um, they did look at depression, anxiety, and those kind of things, and then they did track patients for up to a year or even longer thereafter to look for these kind of things. Other data sources are what we call retrospective observational, meaning that a, a physician like myself would say, okay, let's look at all the people on modafinil, what, what frequency were new symptoms developing after um, you know, they started that drug. And so from that's where I'm reporting some of the, the frequencies of what we're seeing. Um, to the behaviors you mentioned, um, that is very common, I would say, in the narcolepsy population. And, and basically, like things like fidgeting are ways for people to stay awake and alert so that some of it is behavioral um, to, to help actually manage. As long as we have had people pull out hair, and that's a separate situation, but um, fidgeting is quite common. Um, actually, going off of that, um, when I, back when my um, Mrs. legs started acting up, um, when I would get out of cataplexy, it would be almost like I was stimming, kind of like people on the spectrum stim. Um, since Mrs. Leg is a comorbidity, have you seen any overlap with that? Um, other than, you know, it, it is reported in the literature that, um, you know, depending on what you read, somewhere between 20% to 30% of people with narcolepsy have restless legs. We don't know a really strong relationship as to why. They also tend to have very severe periodic limb movements, uh, lots of twitching. So those two conditions, restless leg and periodic limb movements, often kind of go hand in hand. It's almost like once your brain goes to sleep, your legs are still <laughs> kicking around. Um, and we don't understand that. We don't know why that occurs. It seems to be there from the onset of symptoms, you know, so it's not like something that develops secondary from medications per se, although that certainly is something that could be made worse by medications. Uh, medications like uh, venlafaxine or fluoxetine, um, which are oftentimes used for cataplexy control, can actually increase restless legs. <laughs> 